Good evening, and thank you for joining us. We'll just give it another minute for people to join in, and then we'll get started. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for Author Works. Fasten your seat belts because we have two very exciting and award-winning authors in the house. A very warm welcome to Sujata Messi and Nev March. There is nothing more satisfying than an intelligent historical mystery with endearing <laughs> characters and set in a culturally rich time period. I'm Rohini Gupta with the Howard County Library System. This is a webinar and only the panelists are visible. Please use the Q&A box or the chat box to um, type in your questions. And I was just trying to see if I have enabled the chat box. So I'm going to do that. Give me a second, I forget this part. Okay, so the chat box is enabled and you can put in your comments in the chat box or through Q&A. Um, this event is being recorded and we will post this on our HCLS YouTube channel about a week from now. Sujata's much-loved protagonist, Praveen Mystery, is Bombay's only female solicitor. She grapples with class division, sexism, and complex family dynamics as she seeks justice for her clients in Sujata Messi's award-winning series. The fourth installment in this fan favorite series was released last month, The Mistress of Bhatia House. This series is set in colonial India in, in around the 1920s, and it is immersed in or really saturated with the history and the cultural norms of that period, and that makes it an absolute treasure to read. Sujata was born in England to parents from India and Germany, she grew up in St. Paul's, Minnesota, but she lives right here in Baltimore. She, was a, she started her career as a features reporter for the Baltimore Sun before she became a full-time novelist. The first Praveen mystery novel, The Widows of Malabar Hill, was an international bestseller and won the Agatha McCavity and the Mary Higgins Clark Awards. She has also written earlier the very well-known Reishimura series set in Japan. Welcome, Sujata. It is a pleasure to welcome you back. We did a really innovative class on Parsi cooking last year, and it's wonderful to have you again. Oops, thanks for having me back. And I'm really excited that my friend Nev is here too. I would also like to welcome Nev March, who has a hot off the press book, The Spanish Diplomat Secrets, Secrets Secret, which was released on September 12th. In the Spanish Diplomat Secret, award-winning author Nev March explores the vivid 19th century world of the transatlantic voyage, one passenger secret at a time. Captain Jim Agnihotri and his wife, Lady Diana Framji, are embarking to England in the summer of 1894. And on their very first evening, Jim meets an intriguing Spaniard, a fellow soldier. And within 24 hours, he is Don Juan Nepo Muceno, and I'm sure I'm saying the name all wrong, is murdered. And aboard the beleaguered luxury liner are a thousand suspects, but no witnesses to the locked crime locked cabin crime. All you Agatha Christie lovers out there, I am sure you are intrigued. Nev March is the first Indian-born writer to win the Minotaur Books Mystery Writers Award of America First Crime Novel Award for her ego finalist debut, Murder in Old Bombay. After a long career in business analysis, she returned to her passion, writing fiction. 
Nev sits on the NY chapter board of Mystery Writers of America and is a member of Crime Writers of Colors. Thank you so much, Nev, for choosing to spend your evening with us. Oh, thank you for that lovely introduction, Rohini. And hello, I have admired Sujata for years and she's a dear friend. Thank you. <laughs> and now, uh, Sujata and Nev, over to you. Wonderful. Sujata, you're on mute again. <laughs> I keep Sorry. hearing that. You know, it's, I was just telling the ladies that I, I have squirrels that live in my ceiling. This is my writing room and that's that they are my, I wish I could say they were my muses, but sometimes they get to be my antagonists. So I just, I'm afraid, I'm just paranoid that you might hear them. But right now that I think they've gone to bed. And so we're awake and we could talk about mysteries. And, you know, Nev and I, we first met, wasn't it in 20, 17 maybe at the Edgar Awards in New York City yeah yeah it, it might have been um, 17 18 and there was a symposium and um, of course I had just read Widows of Malabar Hills so I had to speak with you but of course if you remember the moment I did you know get to talk to you all my questions left my mind it's like oh, now what do I say well, I remember being so fascinated by the what you were going to write that your first book, um, Murder in Old Bombay, actually touched on a real life murder that I was really fascinated with um, that had just that had also haunted me. And you said it has haunted all the girls in Bombay, that particular murder. But rather than go back to the past I wonder why do, can you talk a little bit for people that who don't know you about your series, the characters in your series? Sure, absolutely. So you're right. That that mystery, um, it was called the Rajabai Tower Tragedy. If anyone's interested to actually look it up, because it did happen and there are news articles about it, and it is an unsolved mystery to date. Uh, that mystery haunted me as a teenager and as a young woman and uh, was used a little bit as a cautionary tale um, growing up. So that's kind of where my um, series did start. So I had, had to create a, um, a detective who would solve this mystery. And that's how Captain James, uh, Captain Jim Agniotri came into being. And the moment I had that name, I knew that he was mixed race because James is English, obviously, a very English name. And then Agniotri is actually not only Indian, it's a Hindu name, it's a Brahmin name. Uh, it carries a lot of um, respect in India. And the combination of those is just very strange. It's like an oxymoron to have a name like that. So in a sense, he, he can't help but he's broadcasting that he's uh, mixed race. But that also carries a whole lot of complications because I have a character now who can travel within English society and also because he's Indian and has been brought up in the army that he can travel around and talk to people within villages within you know poorer sections of society and so on um, and then of course the big question is belonging right where does he really belong where's his tribe so through the series he's learning little bits about civilian life about how people operate how people have biases how people make mistakes the nature of justice and each book forms a little bit of um, his education in a way he's lived all his life in the army because he was an orphan and he had a uh, was an, in an orphanage in Pune and I love Pune so of course there's a lot of Pune in my books it's a part of um, it's a little little town little village at the time but now it's a huge city near Mumbai um, but he he also then has a love interest. <laughs> so uh, Diana Framji appeared in the first book. I did not intend that. Here I'm trying to create a Sherlock Holmes-ish character, a very Poirot-ish character. And of course, the first thing he does, my character goes and falls in love with the wrong woman, <laughs> yeah, with his client's sister. So through the first book, we learn about that. But... The second book is really set in America because they are immigrants and they're learning a little bit about American culture 
um, through the Gilded Age. And if you know people know about the Gilded Age, it's, it was a time of enormous class conflict and class division. And here you have an outsider point of view because they are not American at that point in time, they, although they, they do become naturalized citizens. And then eventually in the third book, which is just released, they're on a ship that's going from New York to Liverpool. And again, you have this who's who international cast, which I love, by the way. I think the world is very international and we should <laughs> recognize that in everything. And so my books do have a lot of um, multicultural and foreign and international characters. And in and they're complicated. They're not caricatures. They are complicated. They have devious motives sometimes. But this is this was just so much fun for me to create that um, that journey. So we're in now in uh, book three, and I just started writing book four. <laughs> Sujata, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, this fourth book because I'm honestly a series is not an easy thing to write. But I loved uh, The Mistress of Bhatia House, and it's number four. So I'll tell you, all of them, Wid Widows of Malabar Hill, beautiful, beautiful book. I think it sold like a billion copies or something. Uh, then there was the Satapar Moonstone, which has this wonderful mystique of um, the, the princely states and the intrigue that always fascinated me. The Bombay Prince, again, based on real events, real events there. And now The Mistress of Bhatia House. Tell us a little bit about, um, just for people, frame that series for us, because Purvin Mystery is adorable. <laughs> wow, I'm so touched that you have read all the books in the series. That really is pretty, <laughs> it's a real gift and a real kindness for you to do. Um, so I yeah, love them. The, the fourth book in the series, and I started writing it um, probably, mm, when let's see it's 20 I, I probably started about three three four years ago like the ideas started to ferment um and I was thinking about the relationship that she has like so my heroine also has a cross-cultural relationship now your your people have I don't want to give any spoilers away of what's going on in their relationship but I think they're in a better place than Perveen is. Like Perveen's in a place of total secrecy. And also she's trapped by a lot of laws that would make it very difficult to marry the person she's interested in. Um, but of course, people are in love and they have relationships. And so I started wondering about like, what could you even get birth control in 1920s Bombay? And that opened a whole can of worms for me. And I, I began to learn that um, in those days, um, women died so often from childbirth, sometimes the first, sometimes the second or third, sometimes many years after um, because of these damages to their internal organs and they couldn't get medical care because doctors are male and their families didn't want them to be dishonored by going to a male doctor. So there was a lot of conversation about these issues in the 1920s. And there was a very early start toward women doctors. And um, there were still rules about disseminating information about birth, birth control is that that would be obscene. And then they had their own abortion law, but their abortion law, while I thought, oh, this is going to be the most restrictive abortion law in the world because it's a hundred years ago, it's actually more lenient than the laws that were like, you know, handed down last week. You know, there was a trial where a 17 year old girl went to prison for a short time and her mother went to prison for a long time for helping her get an abortion medication. Um, it, I think this was in Nebraska. So it, that was really interesting to me. And I, so I worked, uh, so I created a mystery that dealt with Perveen going into these issues that people don't want to talk about. And they actually need a male barrister to help them in court um, on behalf of somebody. And nobody wants to touch the issue. So that was, so this is probably the most socially, um, social issue book of the series. And I think that they 
have different kinds of feelings. Like the first one, I was really interested in introducing Perveen and her life's journey. The second one, like you said, it was the interesting things about the uh, the way that the British and the the British government worked to control the the free monarchs, and then there was the political. So I I do different things to to mix it up like that, and so I feel like. It was interesting that you decided to take this book onto an ocean liner rather than have it in a country. Like you are skipping all over the place. And <laughs> that is really unusual because a lot of times people say, well, they want the book. They, they're they buying it because it's a Chicago mystery. They're buying it because it's an India mystery. But you're taking your Indian characters all over the world. So my first question to you is, was did did Indians travel quite a bit in this age? Who were they? Why did they go? And like, what did this mean to you to set this this book on an ocean liner? Right. Yeah. So a good number of Indians traveled. Um, I mean, we're not talking about Second World War when 2.5 million Indians served in the British Army and helped win the war. We're not even talking about that. We're talking about way before that in the 1800s. So it was difficult for Brahmins to travel across a, an ocean because they would lose caste. There was a whole ceremony that they would have to undergo um, you know, in order to regain their status. It was taboo in a sense to travel across an ocean. So in the second book in my series, Peril at the Exposition, we have Swami Vivekananda crossing the ocean to go to Chicago for the Parliament of World's Religion, the first Parliament of World's Religion that was held during the World's Fair in Chicago. Well, that really happened. He really did. He's a 30-year-old, 30-something-year-old sage, a sadhu, was a holy man, and he crossed the ocean. He was on a ship, and he did go to Chicago, and he did speak at the Parliament of World Religions. On that ship, he actually met uh, Jamshedji Nasarwanji Dada, the doyen, the founder, in some sense, of the Parsi. Um, uh, clan, the Tata clan and the Tata enterprises. And he did actually, this is recorded in history. It's recorded on the Tata website, actually, that uh, Swami Vivekananda and JN Tata had this conversation about science and religion. We're talking 1893, 1893, way, way long ago. And at the end of that conversation, uh, JN Tata actually offered Swami Vivekananda a job, which he declined. He said, no, I'm a spiritual person. But they did talk about the creation of the Indian Institute of Sciences. And that is how that the original uh, institute was formed. Years later, it was formed by the descendants uh, of JN Tata. But there were many, many uh, travelers to Europe. Um, in fact, I'll talk about two um, there's a lady, Bikaji Kama, who is quite an interesting character. And we're talking about the 1930s, 1920s, 1930s. She's a Parsi lady. She was actually separated from her very loyalist husband because she was a nationalist. She went against her husband's political opinions. Shocking for that time. Well, she went to Europe and she's traveling around to come back to India. The British Customs and um, Border Authority wanted her to sign a commitment that she would not um, go against British rule, would not promote nationalism. And she refused to sign it. She wouldn't give that commitment. So she spent the rest of her life in exile in Europe. Now, she is also credited with creating the Indian flag. Today's India's, the main flag of India, it was created by this Parsi woman. Um, so, you know, few people realize how, you know, she, she traveled, she spoke, she was very influential. But I'll give you another one. There is a charming Gujarati story that my aunt used to tell me pieces of the story because it was serialized in an old newspaper called the Jame Jam Shade. It's a very ancient paper. And the, the, the book is called Mamaiji Ni Musafiri. So if you know Gujarati, that means the travels of granny. <laughs> and it covers the travels of this charming and very naughty old lady, <laughs> old Parsi lady who went around Europe and she kept saying things like one of the parts of the story. She said, um, everybody tells me, Malse bakru, malse bakru, pan bakru maltunch nati. 
everybody tells me you'll get a goat, you'll get a goat, but I never get the goat. The problem was they weren't talking about a goat. They were saying merci beaucoup. <laughs> merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup. And she just translated into Gujarati. <laughs> You're going to get a goat. <laughs> so things like that. Um, Mamai Jini Musafri is in Gujarati, the whole novel. And I do have it. Finally, I have uh, managed to find it. But I do have to struggle a little bit to plow through the Gujarati lettering um, because it's been 32 years since I left India. So it's a little bit of a, a slog to get through it. But I'm looking forward to that because... These kinds of delicious little, um, call them historical archives, they provide stimulus for the next book. And so the current book that, I'm, that I've just uh, launched uh, is based upon real events again, where Captain Jim's on this ship. And um, Jean Paul, Jean, uh, uh, Don Jean Nippo Messino was a real person. And I kept that wacky name because he was a very significant character, even though he was a Spaniard, what he did changed the course of American history. And few remember or you know really know the details of the Spanish-American War over Cuba. And we're traveling on this transcontinental transatlantic ship. That's only five years before the American, uh, Spanish-American War over Cuba. So here are the precursor events to that war. And of course, I, I, uh, when I read a little bit more about the history of this guy, uh, Jean Nipomusino, I'm going, oh, he's going to be my victim. He's the victim of the crime. <laughs> so it is uh, another story that's based on real events, but uh, I won't give you too many spoilers. Um, there's, there are layers to this story and, and there are layers to the stories that I read that, that um, Sujata has written. So you can read it as a straight mystery, but there are so many societal questions, social questions that come up. I think both of us were writing last year when um, Roe v. Wade was struck down. And I think it hit us in different ways, uh, but it hit us, um, you know, it was very momentous, uh, you know, while we were writing. So I have a character called Dora and it was a little controversial when I inserted her in there, but it made so much sense. Um, at one point, she's a potential suspect for the murder, you know, to, to be the killer and so on. But she's carrying a lot of sad secrets. And so I think as people will read, some will recognize that person in a whole lot of young women today and will question whether, can we really find empathy or, or are we so committed to the letter of the law that we cannot see the people and we can only see, you know, the, the, um, the predisposition of what we want, you know, the, the focus of what we want people to do. So I did want to pose real world situations. And frankly, every day, every week, we're coming up against new situations that make you think, what is the right thing here? And maybe that's the point of books, is to make you think, what is the right thing here? So let me, let me go back um, to something that Sujata had said. When you write, do you first think about the societal question that is, that is nagging at you? Or does that come while you're writing? Like, you find a good story and you start to write it. And then, and then <laughs> the societal question peels back and you start figuring out the layers yeah that's a that's a good question and it also um ties in with something that robin said in the chat that um they wanted to know if our how much we plan it out and whether the characters take over <laughs> and i would say that i really don't start out saying i want to talk about a societal issue mm -hmm. um but i did have an i do think about where the characters are in the series. Like, for example, Perveen lives in a joint family and her brother and sister-in-law finally have a pregnancy and are going to have a baby. So I knew this baby was going to be born in this book. And I wanted to see 
how it would affect Praveen because of course she says, oh, it's wonderful the baby's coming. But what does it mean when a baby comes into your house and you might never be able to have your, your own child and you're a working woman and you're seeing somebody who's being supposed to be ultra feminine, but she's actually not doing the greatest. She's struggling with it, we would say. She's struggling. So I let the, I, I sort of think about where the characters are. And honestly, I also sometimes listen to my readers and there's, it's not like we're writing um, fan fiction or something like that. But if readers are very good at saying, you know, I really want to know more about this member of the cast. Like I have the character Alice, who is Praveen's good friend, who she went to, um, they were both at St. Hilda's College in Oxford together. And Alice is a, is a white woman and she's also a closeted lesbian. And I've hinted very, very little about it. And it's time for Alice to have her own story about her own relationship. But I knew I couldn't just do it as book two because I was already so fascinated about going to the palace and I wanted to see if Perveen might meet somebody along the way, but I didn't know who it would be until it was, until it happened, then it was too late. Sort of like falling in love, right? You don't know who you're going to fall in love with. And, and so that sort of is the story of, of writing these books that so, we yeah, so tell me a little bit about the inspirations because writing these books, it has it, it's quite a journey, right? Um, I know you've uh, you know taken inspiration from two real life women lawyers, but are there other real life inspirations um, that prompted this book, The Mistress of Batia House? Yeah, there are a couple. The first one that's the most obvious one was I was interested in in learning about the first women doctors in in Bombay and it turned out that the first woman OBGYN was a Jewish Indian woman called Dr. Jerusha Gerard. Have you heard about her? I have heard about her. Another person you should look at is uh, Ratan Bai Bakil. But tell me about this. Oh, yeah, that's more of your era. So yeah. you're, you're really into your, so she was, um, yeah, Jerusha was not the first, but she was the person who began First of all, she she um, studied medicine in Britain and she came back and she really wanted to work at the Kama Hospital and she could not get a job there. She oh. finally eventually did. So we're talking about the Kama family was very philanthropic and the hospital was was from a male Kama. It wasn't from Madame Kama. It was, I don't know if it was her husband or a different, but it was Anyway, and the idea was the hospital was supposed to be staffed by women doctors, but it never came to be that there was just a handful and it took her a long time. So she had her own practice and she was the one who started saying, hey, we're seeing a problem when when people are raising their daughters in seclusion, like inside the house, their bones are softer. So if they have a baby, if you marry them at 11 and they have a baby, their, their bones are very soft, so they're going to have more problems. So she was a big campaigner for delaying, um, you know, motherhood and also for, you know, letting women out of the house and, you know, all kinds of things like that. So she, but I, and I was faced with a question, do I make her the real, the real doctor in the book or not? Wait. Yeah. Just like you had the thing where you put the real Spanish diplomat in there. And, yep. and, and I had it. So I was working or, you know, I was consulting with, with a, a source who was part of this Jewish community, the Bene Israel community. And she said, like, why don't you just put her in? But then I realized, well, if I want to have her, I don't know what her views are on abortion and birth control. I honestly could not find out her views. And yeah. I want to give her a view that wasn't her own view so right. I decided to make somebody who was a lot like Jerusha Gerard and then I could also create what is her own um love story is she single is she married um who does she live with and so there are some real similarities like she lived with her mother for a very long time 
which is what this character does. And then the other inspiration that was was interesting, and I think it was very, very subconscious, is there is a famous Parsi heiress, Rati um, Petit Jinna. Yes. Oh, yeah. This big family, um, the Petit family. Am I saying that right? Did they say Petit? Uh, Petit, just Petit. Petit. I went to Abu Bay Petit school and I know that story well, but it's a tragedy. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay, so so this beautiful girl that she's in a progressive, freedom-loving, you know, noble family because they've been knighted by the British. Her yes. father happens to be friends with Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who at the time was a was successful barrister in Bombay, a Muslim, and he's a freedom fighter. So the two men were great friends. And there's this beautiful 16-year-old girl walking around. And from what I've read about it, she really had a crush on him and she had a strong personality. And so they, so, you know, Mr. Jinnah and Rutty got together and the family got really upset about it. And so she wound up eloping and converting to Islam. But you know what? After she had their first child, she just kind of like fell to pieces she left her child with her husband and went back to live with her mother. And I think there even were trips to Paris and things like that. Like she just lived this other life. Um, and of course there was no, you know, just a few weeks ago, we had the first pill for postpartum depression come out. Like women yeah. with postpartum, have, they're struggling in 2023. Yes. So imagine what it was like then. So that's yes. just, a, that's like a little, she's an inspiration. I'm not, I'm not going to say everything that happens with Golnaz, but, um, you know, I, I realized when I was writing the character that this, this, this scenario had played out somewhere else. And that made me feel confident about what I was doing. I didn't feel like I was putting a modern perspective on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, this is a very, um, extremely topical uh the bella versus the club case i've been reading about that this is very much parsi history and um you know i grew up with people saying oh you know parsis being the persian um descendants or uh descendants of persian um refugees really from iran and we're talking about thousands of years right 1,200 years, perhaps. So we were very Indian, but this idea that, you know, Parsis are very equal in the genders. It's not so, you know, being part of Indian um, culture and tradition, there is a lot of patriarchy, really, and um, many disproportionate rules for men and women. So the Rati Jinnah story is a tragedy and, and did happen in the 1940s, I think 1950s, um, that that happened. Um, she died very young, by the way. You know, if you look at how she died, that's really tragic. But before that, 1905, there was the Bella versus Saklat case. There was the uh, another case where a very influential person in the Tata family married a French woman and wanted mm -hmm. her to be Zoroastrian. So there's another lawsuit that ended up. These lawsuits ended up uh, rulings were against women. Yeah. So we've inherited a lot of misogyny, and and this is not just historical. This isn't just oh, wow, this is things that happened in the past. This is happening now. The Uniform Civil Code has been announced in India, and it is up right now being uh, run by different communities and community leaders. And a lot of communities are opposing it because it gives women a lot of freedoms. It gives women equal rights in many, many things, in adoption, in inheritance, in divorces. I mean, think about so many years, you know, India is over, uh, you know, hundreds of years old, but but as a re republic, only about seventy odd years, seventy five years. Um, we have in India separate rules for separate religions. Yeah. Um, so it is a high time that India had a uniform civil code, but it is happening now. This is not, you know, historical fiction isn't about history. Yes, it's set in a different time, and it tells you how things happen. But it is very much about the issues of today. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So so let me just ask one thing, because I'm I'm writing this fourth book right now. And uh, it is yeah, my characters do take over. OK, I have an outline and they don't listen. So they do take over. But and then, of course, revisions are a bear because I have to bring it all back together again. 
So I'm going to take this opportunity to ask an experienced writer, multiple series, Sajata, how do you keep it engaging and fresh and for yourself as you're writing it and also for the reader? It doesn't feel that <laughs> way. Like, I just think I have to take a lot of breaks, honestly. I mean, I don't think it's a job that people can do eight hours a day. And I know there are a few writers like Ann Perry, the late Ann Perry, who's a brilliant writer, who was able, or at least she told people that she would write eight hours a day or 10 hours a day. I don't know if it was true, but I do know that I saw a video of her working and I do know she works very focused, but I, but I have a lot of interests in my life. And I just think that I have to get away to come back. And also I feel like the series have to be fun too. Like if it's got to be, there's got to be something really enjoyable in there for me as a writer. And that reminds me that there's something I've been dying to ask you. One of my favorite parts of the entire book you wrote was there was a, a time when Lady Diana said, look, something's missing. I'm going to find it. And I don't know if you came up with that whole idea or just just tell tell us about that because she 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 ascribes it to Parsi tradition. Yeah, so there is this very ancient method of finding things. And it, it is so old, um, but many of the, my peers have never heard of it. So um, the method, I have seen it three times in my life. Um, the first two times I was a child and my grandmother and my mother performed this method. And the third time um, I was a teenager and my mother and I performed this method. So it involves, if you have something very, very precious that you have lost, you know, you can't find it. It may be a ring, it may be earrings, it may be some other jewelry, it may be papers, it may be documents, maybe title, something really precious. You perform this very strange ritual. And because I had actually seen it performed, I wrote it into the book because Diana then uses it to try and find a, a person, a person who's in a wheelchair. And I, I've never known this used to find a person, okay? It is only for objects. But, uh, and Diana is, uh, you know, also very ambivalent about using this so-called superstitious method. So what it involves, and I'm going to describe it because it's kind of strange. It involves three objects that probably people had even 300 years ago. An iron key. It cannot be any other metal, only iron. An iron key, uh, a prayer book. An old prayer book, the older, the better. And a kasti, which is a thread, a sacred thread that all Parsis wear around our waists when we say our morning prayers and then you say it in the night again. So you unwind the prayer of the thread, you say your prayer, and as you're saying it, you tie this um, thread around your waist. So these three objects are then tied together. The key is inserted inside the book. The kasti or the thread is wound around in a certain way and the ends are tucked inside. So the whole book is now suspended by that key and two individuals have to say their prayers and then they sit across from each other and hold the key literally dangling on their fingertips. And now the procedure is you ask questions um, of the almighty. Uh, Dear almighty, I'm looking for my earrings. Is it in the safe? You ask it three times. And then you ask, is it in the house? And you ask it three times. And then you ask every room, is it in the kitchen? Is it in the bathroom? Is it in the first bedroom? Is it in the, whatever, the whole house. And <laughs> this is so strange. All three times at some spot, you're not supposed to move. You're just sitting there. You're sitting there with the key dangling. You're getting tired <laughs> and the key just flips. The key flips and the book falls because it's suspended with your fingers. All three times it was right. Explain that to me. All three times it came out right. And, and the third time when I was actually doing it, it told us that the, the object, I think it was my mom's ring or something, is in the locker. And she had already been to the locker. That was why we were doing it. She said, how can this be? It's I've checked the locker. Well, it was actually in the locker. It was way at the back and it had gotten stuck to something magnetic. It was actually in the locker. <laughs> so very strange. I know it's totally superstitious, but I was so fascinated by this methodical, because it's very methodical, this method of, this ancient method 
of clearing your mind and asking questions. And I wrote it into the book. <laughs> so it, it really did exist. A lot of my stuff really does come from memories or uh, traditions or strange things that I've seen and, and maybe at the time did, couldn't quite understand. And now I'm looking it up to try and find it or um, little, little, you know, bits and pieces of information that form the tail end of a, a mystery. So I just did a, a little work for an octogenarian and amongst his, he was writing about Simla in the 1930s. He grew up at that time. And there was a story about a boy being murdered in a boarding school. And I'm going, hey, wait, this could be a future book. <laughs> so I don't know if it will make it, but it just, it just caught my interest. It just caught my interest in such a deep way. I'm like, I need to know more about this. <laughs> so this is how stories come to me. <laughs> Yeah, don't we love the octogenarians and nonagerians and beyond in our life? We just want them to stay well and keep sharing their stories. And Nev, it's the fact that you recorded this, which is never, it sounds like it's something people talk about in families. It's like, just like that cookbook with all that Parsi, that famous Parsi cookbook with all those recipes that's very old and that has laid things down. So Precious. Like not only if they get your book, not only are they having a rollicking adventure, but they're getting a piece of history that may not be somewhere else. So it's entirely possible. It's becoming a little bit of a cultural record as well. Yeah, I and, say buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> and Thank that, you. Maybe we should open the floor to some of the questions because it's about a quarter of. Wow. So, yeah. Um, should we, or, oh, I guess Rohini is going to ask them for us. Yes. Well, so you can go ahead and, and ask a question that fascinates you if you would like to do that. Um, I know the first question that Robin had asked that uh, do the characters take over? And Nev spoke to that and said her characters run riot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they take over. Uh, Aban uh, has asked, uh, does your writing energize you or does it exhaust you? Oh, that is a good question. Uh, if I write a scene, you know, a good scene, I'm walking on air for the next week. And nobody has even seen this. Nobody has seen that single, not a single human being. And yet I have this big fat smile on my face. I'm walking on air and I can't wait to get back to writing. Yeah, it energizes me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say it energizes me. The only time it exhausts me is when I go through a stage toward the end of the book where I might actually write a huge amount of words every day and for a really long period just because all of a sudden it's coming out and it's <sighs> got to finish. And so then I'm exhausted at the end, but it's like a happy exhaustion. So Oh, yeah. There's yeah. A that not many words come at all. I confess, I feel a little frustrated. So, you know, there are those days. All yeah. those feelings. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There's a question for you, Sujata, that your characters are from, you know, different religions. They're Muslims, Hindu, Christian, Parsi. And they're also from different economic status. Like you have princesses, you have a rich lawyer family, you have workers, British governors. So you kind of, how do you bring together the the um the cultural norms of so many people you know well the first thing i want to say is that the genre of mystery sets it up to be that way mm -hmm. that mysteries involve investigation and asking different people and for example even in an agatha christie mystery where you think that most of the people are wealthy there are always are these other people coming in people in the village people that work for those people and um, so there's just different ways, you know, the, the, the genre is perfect for, for going different places. And then the second factor is India is really diverse like that. And um, especially in those days, people really did um, move, they sort of integrated without as, you know, there may have been some prejudices, but there weren't these overt uh, you know, as many overt tensions every day so that it was 
you know, quite believable that there would be households where there would be a lot of different people that would be working together that were of different faiths and that did business and study together. And then I guess the last part of it is that I'm a, I'm a, you know, a tricultural person um, because I've grown up in, in different countries. I come from a mixed marriage. I have a mixed marriage. Um, my kids are adopted from India. So I've always felt um, that like, that's a norm for me. Comfort it's, level in yeah, jumping. Between yeah. It's just to be with a lot of different people. So that's why I wouldn't feel comfortable writing about one world because I don't belong to one world. That's a wonderful answer. And I think I'm going to hop over to Robin's uh, next question because it's pretty interesting. Uh, I have read several books that have a Parsi main characters, uh, a fine balance, for example. Uh, they seem to get along well with both Hindus and Muslims, but I... I am wondering how much political power they have. For Nev. <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah, so Parsis were extremely influential um, in the 1800s and I would say even early 1900s. Uh, as the community has dwindled in India and moved, really migrated to the West, the political power in India has clearly shrunk. However, if you remember that one gentleman, Adar Punarmala, put his entire fortune, three generations worth of fortune at risk in order to create India's vaccine and produce millions, I mean, upwards of a billion doses before the Oxford vaccine was approved because you cannot produce a billion doses on a turn of, of, of dime. He did that and allowed India to gained vaccine diplomacy. India was exporting vaccines to the rest of the world. That guy is Farsi, okay? <laughs> so we might be a few, <laughs> but we still we do might good be. things. <laughs> I, I have just a little side story to tag on this. And I know my dad is watching. So this is a story. When my dad and I visited um, India together in the 1980s, when I was in my mid twenties, we happened to stumble into a a Parsi New Year party, or it was actually, it was the, it's the earlier one. It's no ruse. It's not the, it's not the other one. It's sort of the more Persian, right. Persian New Year. And yes. we, we just got invited into this party that was going on at this cultural center. And it was, it was so wonderful. You know, I had never met Parsis before. And the person who was one of the speakers at the dinner was a government minister, a Parsi, who had just announced that he had helped, that the government, the Indian government was now going to award money to Parsis who had children and help them with, you know, reproductive um, issues like infertility. So that that's saying how much that the government would give a subsidy to the Parsis to have children where they don't give it to anyone else that's a sign. I mean, that seems like they think these folks are gold. <laughs> well, with a, and if you've got 1.5 billion people in your country, you don't want more, okay? You do not want more people. But the <laughs> fact that the community is valued and, and treasured in a way and, and is shrinking, um, you know, caused this um, actual economic policy to be put into place. Um, it, you know, having a third child is, is almost unheard of within the Parsi community. And, and actually within many communities where women are educated and with a, you know, are working and have careers and have busy lives, um, one or two children, that is the norm. So this was to encourage them. I don't know how successful it's been, but it is very sweet that they tried. I know somebody <laughs> who's had two children on that scheme. So, but I'm sure oh, wanted her well, children, you know, they wanted their children, but sure. more power to them. There are many um, Parsi families that um, are, are not only just wealthy, but are, um, you know, philanthropists that the Punawalas are some of them, uh, the Tatas, the whole Tata conglomerate, the Godridge conglomerate that I write about because uh, the story that I uh, started with was from the Godridge family. Um, but there are many like this, um, you know, the Gigi Boys, the, the Saklad family, which actually has a very labor-oriented history. Uh, Sir Saklad was actually member of parliament uh, in England 
um, just after, or, um, you know, right after um, uh, the Grand Old Man of India, <clears throat> Nada Bhai Nauruji, again, first person to represent India in the British Parliament was <laughs> a Grand Old Man of India, was Nada Bhai Nauruji, was a Parsi. So yeah, there used to be a lot of influence. I want to say that it has shrunk, but there's still a few people doing good things and and um, I want to say influencing India for the better. Um, you know, everyone recognizes after the horrible terrorist events that happened in India um, uh, in, um, you know, a decade ago, I want to say now that, you know, the Tata stepped up and not only compensated the victims, but mm -hmm. um, created a grant for free education of those children who had been orphaned by the terrorists during that attack. Uh, and they didn't have to do that. These not necessarily the employees. They did that for everybody who had been impacted by those terrorist events. There are very few people who can be that farsighted or that giving. Uh, in fact, the Tata Foundation, its largest use of money, you know, what, what do they do with the money? It's, it goes into philanthropy. The entire corporation, entire um, profits of all the corporations, uh, of course, it's a public limited company, so they have shares and they pay dividends, but the rest of it goes into philanthropy. That's what they do. <laughs> there's wow. still some, you know, there's still, still a few people, still a few guys doing some good, good work. And I think, and I think the Parsi power has always been economic and ethical. So I think that's where their strength is. And I think we'll jump to the last question here. Uh, since you both write about Bombay in the past, uh, where where do you do your research? How do you find such beautiful stories about times long ago? And how do you do fact checks? Um, Goodness. Well, Go ahead. I, I'll start because I chose, you know, I feel for, for you, Nev, that Bombay, like it's your home. It's like the air you breathe. It's, it's, it's just a natural. It's not really my family heritage, though it is. A, a, I do. My stepdad is is from Mumbai but the reason you know my family is is from Calcutta um but the reason that Bombay is Bombay is such a great place to research I have to say that it's a it's a really easy place um it's an easy easy place to get around um a lot of the old buildings are still used for um business and for government use and so that you can go in and out of them very easily there are places like the comma library where you can do research um there's there's the this incredible the universities and colleges that are some of them you can't get into like nev i think you're the only person who's ever been up in that tower the rajabai clock tower at the <laughs> university of of Bombay, Mumbai University. But of course the Wilson College people said, why don't you go to Wilson College? Because they're always in the films. And yes, I got into, I was managed to get past that guard at Wilson College and get everything I needed. <laughs> so I turned it into Woodburn College in my books. So I would say that um, I love being there for the, the walking through the scenes and I also rely quite a bit on libraries, um, whether they are here or in India to sort of get my ground, you know, my feet on the ground. And so it's actually quite appropriate we're doing this with a library. Yes. Yeah. Yes, How about fabulous. You? How do you? Yeah. How do you Absolutely. Do you? Yeah. So uh, in addition to libraries and actually going there, like I, you mentioned, I actually managed to. Oh, persuade my way into Rajabai Tower and go up that tower, which was terrifying, by the way. Um, the place of the original crime uh, that I wrote about in Murder in Old Bombay. But in addition to that, I'll give you two more sources and they may surprise you. So um, I love talking to elders in our community. I actually run our senior program uh, for Zagni and, and we, you know, uh, sporadically we get together. But I do call them, some of them, and I'll, you know, prod them for stories of their childhood or stories of growing up or is World War II, where were you when such and such happened? And it just st stimulates their thinking and I'll write. I may write four pages during one 30-minute conversation, um, but I also edit 
for them occasionally a wonderful gentleman, Rusi Sorabji, who's now 94, I believe he is 94. So I edited his um, a memoir about growing up in Simla. And I mean, there's details that you cannot get, you know, that the road forked here and the master family lived there. And then there was a Framji family and they had a daughter and her name was Diana. You know, so those little uh, wonderful, you know, details of the place uh, from people who lived there. Uh, I called up one gentleman who had grown up in Karachi and and I said, uh, what color is the mud? If you were playing as a child and your clothes got dirty, what color is the mud? You know, that kind of specificity. And of course, he, he was full of stories at that point because I had just triggered his childhood memories. And I have so much fun with this. I'll give you another source. And it may surprise you. Uh, so growing up, my parents collected books. Books were expensive. And I just cleared out the my parents' home in Bandra, um, part of uh, Mumbai. And I couldn't, you know, sift through. So I just put things in boxes and ship them over here to New Jersey. And I've been going through that. Now I discover that all along growing up, <laughs> there was this whopping fact, fact book by Dosabai from Jikaraka called The Parsis, which gives all kinds of details about the history and the customs and whatnot. It was there all along when I was growing up and I never cracked that book. They have a three volume set called L.E.S. Le Parsi, which is written by a French woman, Delphine Menant, um, in 1897. This is the time period I'm writing in. And she's written in French. It was translated to English by M.M. Marsban in 1919, republished by <clears throat> this lady, Jeru Mango, in 1994. And I have three volumes. I've just gotten through one of them. There's two more volumes to go. And, and this treasure trove is in my own parents' home. I mean, what a gift is this? It's just, it's incredible to me that this is already in my lap. <laughs> I just have to read it. It seems like the answer is connection to people. Like by having genuine, loving connections of like it's community service or being part of your family, these things are here for us. It's like, we don't have to look for an adventure. The adventure is here. <laughs> you know, the adventure is, <laughs> the adventure is right, you know, it's right behind yes. our back. And I mean, yes. that's a really beautiful thing. And I mean, and that's what libraries are about too, right? You know, that we all have our library and we don't really know what's there, but it is, it's our home and it's free. Oh, it has and been wonderful. All of your, like you're saying, like your stories, they're all, they all start around you all your information starts around you and then of course you kind of grow it from there yeah and this this conversation is so incredible and I wish we could just go on and we have so many stories to share and so many anecdotes you know that make it so personal and I loved hearing all the gossip behind all the names Bikaji Kama place you know there's a place in Delhi and all these people that you've heard I didn't know all of these stories I didn't know about Jinnah's wife who ran away and so it was really fascinating to hear these kind of little nuggets of information. And so it was fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. And but before we close up, I did want to say that I will be sending up a follow up, follow up email tomorrow with a survey. Everybody, please, please answer to that. And please save the date on October 15th. We're having a Freedom to Read Roundtable. As you know, the, the right to read, the choice to read is under a discussion, which it shouldn't be. And we have um, a wonderful panel. We have James McBride, his latest book, um, The Heaven and Earth Grocery Store just came out. And uh, we have Alexandra Petri. She is a Washington Post humorist and she is fantastic. We have Dr. Richard Bell. He is a, an all time favorite historian. And uh, we also have Emily Drabinsky. She is the American Library uh, Libraries Association president. So it's going to be a wonderful conversation. And here's the tip. If you come in person, you will actually get a free copy of James McBride's book. Wow. So if you want to register and come, that would be fantastic. And uh, we also are having it virtually so we can have a more attendance in. Yeah, I guess it's only a, a 40 minute drive, 30, 40 minutes for me, a little longer for Nev. 
<laughs> oh, but, it would be perfect. And you can also join virtually, but but Suchata, that would be great. And um, if you come in person, we also have the MD Poet Laureate, Grace Cavalry there. And well, we can make an evening. What a credit to you and the Howard County Library to put together this event. And thank you thank so, you much, so for much for having me. Thanks to the audience for coming tonight. And you've got a lot of choices on your Thursday night. So, and these are wonderful books. So just, I read one, I haven't read Nev's yet because I'm trying to get my hands on it, but these are great. So uh, I'm going to do a plug for the audiobook because the audiobook is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the guy who read it, uh, who narrates it, he actually performs it, is Vic Adam. And he did the first book uh, and a portion of the second book. Vic Adam is phenomenal. Uh, and he's he's the one who's done the audiobook for book three, uh, The Spanish Diplomat Secret as well. So if you don't get the, you know, the, the paper copy, um, get a hold of the audiobook. You won't be, you won't be uh, sorry. It is just, he's performed it so that it gave me chills. <laughs> And, and that is great. Sometimes hearing the book is so much uh, makes it uh, the voice makes it come alive uh, really well. So uh, and I think a lot of people are doing uh, audibles and audiobooks these days. So that's fantastic. And I must um, Benita Tucker has just said she loved your audiobook. Nev, so <laughs> uh, thank you so much for taking out time uh, in your day to day to share it with us and everybody in the audience. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today evening. And, and it was a great discussion. It was just fantastic. And um, I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you so much, Rohini and Sujata. <laughs> yeah. So we meet again. I'm sure we'll meet again because Rohini always has something up her sleeve. Let's do something. Let's do something great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thank Take you, care. everyone. Good, Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Bye.